Hi, preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. I wanted to take a minute to let you know that our spring fundraising campaign is officially underway. I hope you're able to join us throughout the month of May as we come together to demonstrate the impact you have as part of the working preacher community. Every gift counts towards helping us reach our goal of raising 75000 to continue supporting preachers like you with the quality content you rely on week after week. Working Preacher would not be possible without your support, and the entire Sermon Brainwave team is incredibly thankful for each and every one of you. With your support, countless congregations will be able to hear informed, creative, and transformative sermons. As a special thank you, we will send anyone who makes a gift during the spring fundraising campaign bonus working preacher content. This content will not be available anywhere else and will only be available to donors of the spring campaign. You don't want to miss it. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Thank you for your support and making this ministry possible. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for May 12th, 2024. Uh, it is the seventh Sunday of Easter, and we are still in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we uh, are, have skipped a chapter. Uh, last week we were in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the love chapter, faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. We're kind of doing a greatest hits here uh, in First Corinthians <laughs> because we're we're skipping over chapter fourteen uh, and going to First Corinthians fifteen, uh, verses one through twenty six and fifty one through fifty seven. Of course, you're welcome to read those verses in between twenty six and fifty one as well. But it's all well. That would be a really long reading, but you you can decide that. Uh, First Corinthians fifteen, of course, is this uh, incredible chapter that Paul writes about the resurrection. And he is writing to uh, to the, the church at Corinth uh, because apparently some of them doubt the resurrection. Uh, um, so he, uh, he says, you know, I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Um, and then he goes on to kind of chide the Corinthians right? Uh, in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. So he, he goes on. Uh, uh, this is just, again, uh, this incredible chapter, um, sometimes assigned uh, uh in the Revised Common Lectionary for Easter Sunday, but certainly we're still in the season of Easter, so you can proclaim, uh, you should proclaim this resurrection faith and this resurrection hope, uh, not just in the season of Easter, but throughout Thank the you. year. But uh, the the key turning point here uh, uh, in verse uh, is really verses nineteen and twenty. So Paul goes on to say, you know, if you if uh, if there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised, and then those who uh, who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, Paul says in verse nineteen, we are of all people most to be pitied. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. the, that's a stark statement, right? If 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 for this life only we have hoped in Christ, then we are of all people most to be pitied because we're you know we're believing in a lie, we're believing in a myth. Mm-hmm. But then Paul goes on, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being and and then kind of burst into the hallelujah chorus, right? It's this beautiful turning point. I would just encourage you as you preach to, to, well, to follow Paul's lead, frankly, rhetorically, and to, 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 you know, make that move to... If the resurrect, if Christ has not been raised, then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then we are of all people most to be pitied, right? Then death has the last word. Then, you know, you're you're never gonna see your your parents or your grandparents again, or your you know your spouse, right? That to 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 dig into that a bit uh, before you then make that rhetorical move to say, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, right? That's the Easter proclamation. 
that in the midst of sorrow and grief and uh, doubt and uh, uh, and fear uh, and death, uh, in fact, the world is turned upside down. To go back to that passage in Acts, the world has been turned upside down, uh, and Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So that would be my encouragement as you preach this Sunday. I appreciate that uh, the homiletical move of um, the reality of what is lost, uh, and then to move toward uh, that genuine victory. Uh, um, that this this text allows you to do that. Um, one of the things that uh, I uh, this is why I love uh, Corinthians, and, and that is that. One of the things that is true for ancient Corinth is the many philosophies and ideologies that they have options to. And so Paul is basically saying, ours is not just another idle myth. It's not just another great wisdom. It's not some other promise. And he is speaking into a context where people believe certain philosophies and that's enough for them. And he's saying, the victory for us is that we have something even more. And um, if, if, yeah, the pity that that that's um, that that's that's a double-edged sword. He's not just saying shame on us. He's also pointing the finger out, saying that's what everybody else has. You know, it, it's it's almost like Jesus says, you know, isn't that what the heathens do? You know, it's like, well, yeah, they believe good words. But we have the power of a God who can overcome death. And so we have this hope to follow the words that we've been, been reading before. That's something to lead up to, to get excited for rhetorically. It is. Uh, thank you both. Um, I've got uh, just, I've got three different things. One is uh, in, in verses three through 11, you get the narrative part of the Easter season from Paul's perspective that, and notice I handed on to you as a first important, what I in turn had received. Some people call Paul the second inventor of Christianity. That old, that old misbegotten uh, notion has been um, overcome in scholarship uh, and shown to be false. Paul uh, is handing on to them what he received, and the thing that turned him from a persecutor into a convert. Exactly. Uh, the story about Christ's death, resurrection, and then the appearances that he go, that he describes. Second thing, in the middle of the chapter, uh, Catherine pointed to what she, uh, with the money verse, uh, but she, you <laughs> know, the, the turning point, you called it. Um, and that, you're exactly right. My great teacher, Roy Harrisville, who died at 101 last July, um, his son preached a sermon at his, at his funeral, which is in the latest Word and World, I believe, the spring Word and World, uh, the sermon you could go and find there. On that verse, Roy had said, this is what I want you to preach on. And I'll just read the ending of it because I have the sermon. But in fact, Christ has been raised for the dead. Dad is dead. We can say that without fear. Now he rests in silent in pe and peace until awakened by the trumpet at the last day when the dead shall rise and we shall all be changed. Death will not have the last word. The last word is life. Mm. The last word in Christ is life for dad. And in fact, life for every one of you. And that is, uh, it was a great uh, uh, sermon, Roy. Thank you for it. And thank you for uh, really carrying on what uh, this message is in this chapter. Third point, the ending verses. Then we skip ahead to verses 51 through 57, maybe the greatest passage in the Bible. Um, we, we stop at 57. I wish we'd gone through 58, which is the verses that Roy had preached at my first mm -hmm. installation. Be steadfast, immovable, always, always abounding. excelling in the work. But before that, this great line about the end, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And then Paul's got this, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
uh, the band I play in, it's a little uh, amateur bluegrassy band. My banjo player, Steve, wrote, he writes a lot of songs, and he wrote a song, Oh Death, Where Is Your Sting? And it's a talent song to death. And we play in this one bar, and there's this old lady, she always asks for that song. Hmm. She sure. always <laughs> asks for it because it explores the mystery, the mystery that the power of death has been destroyed in Christ's death and resurrection. She always wants to hear it. And um, it just, uh, I don't have it. There's no recording of it anywhere, but it, I just offer that. Uh, and then Paul ends in praise. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. I appreciate the, those three points, Ralph. And I would, I, I'll echo your uh, love for verse 58 as well. And in fact, um, I think we would encourage you all to to end with that. Obviously, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ is a wonderful way to end too. But then there's the therefore, right? That because Christ is raised from the dead, because resurrection is real, therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. And here's here's where the part I love, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's just a word for everyone, especially you working preachers out there where sometimes your work may feel in vain. Know that because uh, because your work is in the Lord and because, uh, because life has the last word and because Christ was raised from the dead and we will be too, know that what you do in the Lord, that, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I think that's just a, a beautiful word of hope. Uh, to end with, not just for you, but for your parishioners as well. So I uh, would just encourage you to, to, to spend a little time on that verse as well. It's a incredible thing that while Paul is speaking of the promise of eternal life, that he closes this portion by saying that we're not supposed to wait for the pie in the sky by and by. Right, right. We are to be active in our witness to this faith, to this truth, to this hope. So thank you both for um, adding verses. And uh, I too would encourage, uh, even if it's just the, um, even if it's just the uh, benediction that you use that, it is a sending out that says, because we have this hope, we have a responsibility to live in a very different way. 